Hello, welcome to episode six live stream for the Lotus Casino episode of Percy Jackson. In this, we talk about Annabeth and Luke. We talk about Annabeth's dad. We talk about um, Hermes and Luke. Um, there's some bit about the Lotus Casino and Grover being wonderful. If this is something that you think is fun, feel free to catch the next live stream on Sunday at 3 p.m. on TikTok, where we'll be talking about episode seven in Hades. It's just like promoing because I have one person that's like sitting on. <laughs> yeah. So, how's it going? It's okay, I guess. Yeah. Well, we can forget everything because we're going to the Lotus Casino. <laughs> yeah. That'd be better. Yep. Oh my gosh. No, not the light. Okay. I am <laughs> using my son's laptop to power my ring light and I got to keep it on. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we are talking Lotus Hotel. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anything big that happened before that, right? It was like the bulk of the episode. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. There's a little bit before that's like character development stuff, but the majority of it is them just at the hotel. Yeah, so like going to what the lotus eaters actually are it's such a short section in the odyssey but essentially what the lotus eaters are are they are people that live on an island and they eat this plant um like it wasn't literally lotus although all of the suspected plants that it could have been like when people try to guess what plant they still say lotuses like blue lotus apparently has some sort of like um what do you call it the calming word that starts with an S. Why can't I remember it right now? Sedative, a sedative effect. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically they land on this island and they kind of do their thing where they, they gather supplies and make sure everybody's drank and ate and then they go and explore and try to see what the people are like on this island. And so the two people that they send come across these people, they're just eating this plant that they call the lotus anyway in there and it makes them so blissful that they forget everything else they just want to sit there and eat the lotus mm -hmm. and so odysseus's men forget all about what their home is like they don't want to return home they don't care about home they don't care who they left at home and he has to literally tie them up to get them on the ship like he just tie them up and to tie them to the mast or something oh, wait no i think he tied them to one of the benches or something like that mm -hmm. and um that's the only way they'll leave because whatever this lotus plant is it's just so pleasant they don't want to stop and so it's really vague it's not even a whole like a whole thing in the odyssey it's like a couple of paragraphs so rick had a lot to um to work with there while not having a lot at all at the same time because yeah. in some senses i think most of us would try to make lotus a modern equivalent of like weed or you know like drinking it's very much an addiction kind of thing and maybe it's supposed to be a metaphor for addiction in itself but um just the idea that you know you get so addicted to something it literally makes you forget everything else but Rick turned that into game, well, kind of gambling and kind of video games. Mm -hmm. um, and I reread the book version first, which for 2005, some of the stuff he was describing is like out of this world and would be the best arcade ever. But <laughs> you, nowadays it's like, oh, this this sounds like a pretty normal cafe <laughs> or uh, not cafe, arcade. And like, it's not as impressive to think of like an arcade having VR equipment these days. Mm -hmm. I thought the thing with the book version that is that is like interesting with how like the TV show did it versus the book is that the book version is very it's kind of like they just kind of accidentally end up there. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of reminds me of I haven't gone to casinos very much, but there is one here. Um, and when you get inside of it, you just don't know where you are. <laughs> When you're walking around in there, it's so easy to get lost because everything looks the same. They don't have any windows. They don't have like any clocks because they don't want you to know how long you've been in there. Yeah. And and like the way that it happens in the book is like they're just they just take a cab 
when they get into Las Vegas, when they're trying to figure out where to go next. And the cab driver is just like, here, take this credit card with like endless money on it, where you yeah. will never like run out of money and you will never get kicked out. And so they're like, well, we need to go somewhere to like take a shower because we've been hitchhiking for days by this point. And then they just end up like at the casino and then they get split up and they just like forget who everyone is except Percy. Percy is the only one in the book that like all of a sudden is just like, I'm having fun. <laughs> What's going on? Nothing is yeah. this easy. And like finds the rest of them. But like the TV show version, I think is interesting because they go into it like being aware and knowing that it's that it could be a trap and they still end up getting trapped <laughs> yeah and even though they know that it could happen it still happens anyway and it just kind of is one of those things of even when they try they still it's still everything goes wrong and it goes way more wrong in the show version than the book version actually yeah. um but i just like that that little difference of that even though they're aware they still get messed up <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it's it definitely speaks to how powerful the Lotus is supposed to be in mythology. It's supposed to be that good. And I do also like the addition because they said it was pumping through the air vents in that one. I don't I th don't think that's the way it happened in the books. I can't yeah. remember. Yeah. In the book, they never explain it. It's literally yes. like we're just in this casino and for some reason we just like forget about all of our problems and then Percy just realizes that this dude has been in here since 1977 and he's all of a sudden just like, where am I right now? This yeah. person thinks it's 1975 or whatever and is able to like wake the other two up, but like they, and they just leave. And when they leave, they realize that they have like one day left to, to finish mm -hmm. their quest, but they, they never figure out what it is. It's just like this weird, it's kind of almost like, that was weird. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. know what that was, but that was strange. And they just kind of like move on from it until Nico and Bianca come up later in book three. And they're like, oh, that's what that was. Okay. <laughs> but they, they still have no idea why it's like that. They just know that the casinos like that. But I think on the show, they felt like they had to give people a reason because people watching at home, like my mother and my sister would be like, why is that happening? <laughs> yeah, what's going on with this casino? Um, I mean, yeah, it's very much presented in the books as this casino is just so cool, you don't want to leave. Um, like it has everything, a fluffy bed, like um, they offered them extra bubbles for their bath. And like per Percy talks about drinking two Cokes and like, feeling super energized after that. And it's every kid's dream, you know, just to be left alone in a casino with unlimited funds. And then because they're like out and traveling, having a nice hotel room too. And one thing I thought was kind of interesting about the book version is that the book version, he has Aries backpack mm -hmm. and he throws it away when they get into the whole the hotel like room because he's like i don't want this thing yeah. um, and then it just like magically shows up with them when they leave <laughs> it's yeah. just it's a stalking backpack because it <laughs> wants to kill you but it's just one of those little details that does not happen in the show they never get rid of it because they don't stay that long yeah. um, in order for it to happen i will say too one thing with the show that i liked is that you meet hermes Mm -hmm. That did not happen. He does not show up until Sea of Monsters. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting place to put him. And I like that they bring him there and like introduce him and Luke and all that way like a little bit sooner. Um, when I was listening to the book version, I was like, like almost like surprised by how Percy was finding out about things so much later than the show did like that he doesn't know that Grover is the one that like that was with Thalia and Annabeth and stuff until right before they get to the casino he doesn't know that his mom is alive until Ares tells him like yeah. right before they leave to go to the casino and I was like wow I don't remember that it took that long but it's but it like makes sense that they would tell you that beforehand on the show, but it's just like, wow, that's a really long time for him to not know that. Um, and it made me remember how in the book version, Percy is basically like 
like imagining getting to the underworld and just like finding his mother and just like picking her up and taking her as if nobody would notice oh um, but it's, it's not until they get there that they even that he even knows that she could possibly be saved and that she's not actually dead i was like wow okay that's a lot different and i and i'm glad that they changed that but that's very different <laughs> yeah they do a lot more like I know in writing they talk about show versus tell, and I don't think it's necessarily telling too much in a way that doesn't work because, like you said, you know, for the show, we might need some of those contexts. We might need a little bit more context. And having the kids be the keeper of the myths, because, like, we know uh, Mr. Brenner, when he was the teacher, he super drilled myths into Percy. He was like, this is important. You need to learn this. And Percy's like, why is this important? Mm -hmm. um, and Annabeth, she's just she's just smart. So, of course, she would know. Of course, that would be how she strategizes. Like, I'm going to read every story that I can so that I know what monsters behave like and what their weakness is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, and Grover, I mean, like, he's just part of the lore. I mean, he's, uh, being a satyr means he's more in it than they are in a sense. Mm -hmm. the, I didn't rewatch this episode, but I've watched it a bunch of times so I can remember it. But mm -hmm. this one was one where I was like, I could like point out things of why I think that it's a good adaptation. Mm -hmm. um, like, like sometimes people adapt things like this, like books to shows or whatever. Um, and they kind of throw in like fan servicey things mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't really make sense. Like, um, JK Rowling never gets enough shit. So like the first two Harry Potter movies are basically giant things like that. Like mm -hmm. a lot of things in the, particularly the first two movies that are put in there purely because they're just in the books. There isn't like a reason for them. You don't feel like there's, it, there isn't like as much of like a payoff. Like it's just kind of like, this is in the books. So this is in the movie. And that's literally the only reason why it's there. Um, yeah. But this show, like introduces things or has things happen that only make sense for like the plot or it mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, so you just are like, okay, like you're not just giving this to me to like, so that you will like wave it in the air and be like, hey, remember when this happened in that book series you like? Like the yeah. example that people give in this like episode is how um, the seaweed brain like wise girl like nicknames that Percy and Annabeth say to each other is a whole thing like in the third book when Annabeth is gone Thalia calls Percy seaweed brain and he I'm not exaggerating he wants to stab her he mm -hmm. thinks about stabbing her when she says it and he's like no one else is allowed to call me that shut up basically <laughs> that's him almost that entire he he thinks about stabbing at least five different people in that book but and that's <laughs> one of the times when he does and because it's just it feels more like somebody making fun of him when it's not somebody like Annabeth saying it to him. And it, she doesn't say it until after he almost dies in the river. <laughs> and yeah. so it makes sense that she doesn't say it until that moment. In this episode, he calls her wise girl when they're trying to figure out how do we go in this casino when we know we have to go in this casino, but we also know the casino might make us forget everything that we have to do, but Hermes is in there. Mm -hmm. So we have to go in there. And like by this point, he's asked her for help on a million different things so it makes sense for her to for him to ask and so it just makes sense it doesn't feel like they're being like stupid about it yeah <laughs> that's and like one of the things i enjoy about it is that it like it would be so easy for them to call them to have them call each other by those nicknames in like episode two yeah didn't do that because that doesn't make actual sense <laughs> Yeah, like right after he falls off the arch is when you can tell Annabeth's starting to care about him and like really can't hold it back anymore. So it makes sense that that's when she's like, okay, seaweed brain. <laughs> Cause, yeah, because he knows that underneath that is care. Yeah, and even like the stuff that was also different in this episode before they get to the casino was mostly the discussion that Percy had with Luke that in the book he has it alone i remember they like mention it because it happens in the chapter before this one but he he talks to luke by himself 
And that's that really weird conversation where Luke basically tells him without telling him that Grover was the one that, you know, was out there with them in Thalia. Um, and, but more importantly, that's the conversation where Luke tells him not to trust Annabeth. Yeah. And it's like, what? And it's like, like thinking about that, it's like, oh, that's actually evil that you're telling him not to trust Annabeth. What? Why? That doesn't make any sense when you also call her your sister and think that she's like the best person out there. Okay. But like the, the show version, they have them both talk to Luke. Um, and I like that better purely because we're not in Percy's head, so we can't hear him like thinking about, can I actually trust these people or can I not? Um, but it has like the same energy that Luke is kind of like, I don't know how to put this, like, well, your son's age. So kids like your son's age, like are close enough to the age of these characters. Yeah. They're at that age where they may feel feelings for like the opposite sex, but it's also like, embarrassing that mm -hmm. you do like it's still at that stage where you don't want other people to talk about it or bring it up and when, especially when older kids like tease you about it it feels like they're being mean to you like they're making fun of you about the idea that you might like even somebody as a friend of like the opposite sex yeah but, like when luke is saying like oh you guys sound like a married couple like that could be played off as, oh, he's just kidding with them. And I'm like, no, I think he's making fun of them <laughs> because this is like a 19 year old kid telling two 12 year olds, oh, are you guys dating now? Because they get along <laughs> and yeah. they like, are like making jokes about all the traumatic things that have happened to them in a five day time by this point. Like it has that same kind of feeling of like, what, first off, why are you in like, Chiron's office just being a fucking creeper <laughs> like, yeah. just to start and then also like why are you making fun of them and making them feel weird about being friends shouldn't you want them to be friends sir <laughs> yeah and that's like a super subtle way to create distance between them of like oh you're acting like a married couple so maybe yeah. you guys stay away from each other <laughs> and it's it the thing about that that I like is that it doesn't work that mm -hmm like enough too many things happen with like the arch and the freaking chair that they're like past that point where it doesn't it just doesn't work like i like that they go into the casino together that they don't mm -hmm. split up completely and i especially like that percy tells her about his like creepy ass chrono stream which does not happen in the books like yeah. still, like in the books there's that point where Annabeth literally is telling him like, no, we're, we're like friends now. <laughs> and so if our parents fight, I won't like take my mom's side if she's against like your dad or whatever. Like mm -hmm. she has to say that because he, he honestly doesn't know. Um, yeah. The show version is like much more like a progression that like, it makes sense that Percy would sit there and tell her like, I was watching somebody's dream of them talking about what we're doing, but also I couldn't see that it was Luke. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, on the subject of them splitting up in the casino, I do like that the book had specific like Lotus casino traps for everybody. Mm -hmm. So Grover's was a VR game that was like reverse hunter where the deers hunt humans. <laughs> and when um, Percy cry tries grabbing him because he's realizing, oh shit, there's people here from the seventies. Um, he's like, die humans die while he's like playing and um, <laughs> like the trap for annabeth was a sims-esque game where she was building a city mm -hmm. so we got that like subtle nod to her architecture kind of mm -hmm. um interest but um i also kind of like how they set up like grover's thing that draws him away from the group mm -hmm. is his uncle ferdinand or no wait yeah. is it no his uncle ferdinand was in medusa's it's yeah it's another okay. secret though yeah, I forget the guy's name, but I really like, I always, I really liked that, that the reason why Grover, like, forgets who Percy and Annabeth are is because he sees another satyr, and he ends up talking to them about looking for Pan and all this, like, satyr stuff that he feels that he doesn't want to, like, talk to Percy and Annabeth about because he feels like they have enough shit going on, I don't want to add like more to what they're already dealing with by talking about my own stuff, which yeah. is 
an empathetic person would do something like that. <laughs> but it is like, I really like that, how that that is the thing that makes him, that makes him get lost and that it happens pretty quickly. Like it only takes him like two or three minutes and he's like, he's like, what am I doing? <laughs> like, or who am I or who are you or whatever? Um, I liked that about, it just, I like how he ends up going off on his own and mm -hmm. Percy and Annabeth stay together purely because Percy has no fucking clue who Hermes is. Yeah. So if he, if they're looking for him, he needs somebody with him who's actually met him before. Cause what is he going to do? Like wander around being like, hello, sir. Are you a yeah. god? <laughs> um, but, it, but I just like that they, one of them go off to talk about Luke. And then the other, they're both like dealing with basically other stuff from their past and yeah. having that distract them. Yeah, it's an interesting way. And also it sets us up a little bit more for book two than, um, mm -hmm. well, I don't know, because I also feel like they could have done a little bit more with how like militant um, environmentalist and like pro animal that Grover is. Yeah. But I mean, that sort of comic relief in the books is a little more necessary because they're longer and so when it's longer you're drawing out the dark stuff a little bit more in the show you put a scene in there about grover saying something about the environment or about animals it's not gonna hit the same and um so like the couple nods we have to it are great it's just it would be nice to like have him be you know like really a greenpeace sort of dude or something like that <laughs> That's that's Grover anyway. Like the yeah. the very beginning of this episode, he is like not even thinking about what will happen to the humans when all of these wild animals are out and mm -hmm. Percy has to remind him we don't want any humans to be murdered. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, I don't care. Yeah. And he's just like, Oh, don't worry, the animals will be fine. <laughs> like, I, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was I gonna say about this one? The I really just like this one, the adaptation thing I was talking about before. I like how the really the difference between the TV show and the book and like kind of the things they come up against in the casino is like the overall kind of story of the first five books, which is that the gods literally fuck everything up in their lives, even when they're trying to be smart about it, it's still happens because like the book version they go to the casino they just kind of end up getting lost there because they're kids and they want a break they literally want to take a shower and then they just end up kind of getting sucked into it because and it reminds me a lot of how like i said how casinos can like get you to stay for hours on end um but the the show version is is literally like the gods messing up their entire plan <laughs> like the that's basically the entire first season but especially this one like they they go to the they go to las vegas to find hermes the only reason they're in the casino is to find him they have to go into the casino to find him and he purposefully takes them into another room to have a conversation knowing that they're going to run out of time when they're when he's having this conversation when he knows the entire time he's going to tell them no <laughs> and so it's like hermes purposefully does that <laughs> so that he, they like won't succeed um like granted Hermes has a point like he doesn't want them to go to the place that they go to in the in the next episode where everybody gets killed by the by the waterbeds that's what he's like alluding to or whatever but he still purposely like leads them somewhere has an entire conversation about how much they suck at as parents knowing that he's going to fuck them over <laughs> and they have and they have no idea about that yet. Um, yeah. And it's like everything they do gets messed up by the gods. Like they get they get to freaking Santa Monica and Poseidon isn't there because they took too long. And the only reason they took too long was because of Hermes, because they did everything right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like no matter what they do, they find a way to like just mess stuff up because they just don't care and you just like want to like jump on in the screen and just like slap them around a little bit like why did you have this whole conversation like why did you tell percy that his dad told him that he shouldn't like basically that being a parent is too hard and so i'm just gonna like leave now bye oh my like, gosh yeah. like why why did you take the time to tell him that is that yeah. necessary <laughs> 
how do we feel about Lynn Manuel Miranda as Hermes? Because I don't know. I I like it, but I don't know if I would have put him as that. I really like him as Hermes because he fits. He just like fits Hermes like as a person. Like um, I know that that casting uh was one that like surprised a lot of people like a lot of people didn't like it but then when they watched the show i was like no i get it because i just have to like remember who hermes actually is like he's this god that is doing 50 billion things at the same time and he's like well-meaning but he can never actually be there the way that you his kids would want him to because he's just always doing something else and he's always distracted and he can never like keep up with everything he's trying to get done and that's like that's very much Lynn like Lynn Van Mel Miranda chose Alexander Hamilton to do an entire playoff of because he identified with somebody like Hamilton who wrote like 57 essays <laughs> about something like um like non like literally nonstop just wrote all of them because he just wanted to <laughs> Yeah well and he's been like single-handedly responsible for some of Disney's like best soundtracks recently yeah. Which like, I, I think that's the most Hermes like quality of him mm -hmm. is like his ability to write song lyrics and make them, you know, like they have puns in them. They have really great rhymes. They have like little bits in there that, you know, like when you listen to them, you're like, oh, shoot, that line really hit me hard. So um, and it's it's funny because like at this point now, um, there is some like trailer for a Disney musical with like songs in it and one of the songs i guess people didn't like it was not good and it's at the point where people heard that song and were posting videos of it on tiktok and will be like you can tell that lynn manuel miranda did not write this musical because the song fucking sucks yeah. <laughs> like, it's like one of those things that when he doesn't write the music for one of their animated movies all of a sudden people realize how good he is because this one is nowhere near as good but yeah i like him for Hermes because of that reason he was their like number one choice <laughs> like he was yeah. the one that they wanted and so they didn't have to go to any of their backups because he said yes <laughs> yeah um, and it's adorable watching him with like the young cast like they're like oh my god it's like Mel well Miranda um one of the funniest like behind the scenes stories of that was when Leah met him she had on a t-shirt that had nirvana like a nirvana t-shirt and these kids oh my fucking god they they were born when i was 24 and so they have no idea who nirvana is they just kids like when you're that young i can remember this that you would see things like that on a shirt and think that it's just like a brand like she thought that it was like a clothing brand and she had the shirt on and he's like oh my god i love that band and she's like that's a band <laughs> and the way she put it was like he died and then he came back to life and then asked her like who do you think it is and that's when she's like oh i thought it was a clothing brand and he was just like oh my god and yeah. then like try to explain to her who Nir who like nirvana is <laughs> yeah but so it's i like that he is hermes and i like that they included hermes this early on because of luke stuff yeah it definitely um, develops luke a little bit more yeah and it just and it also it weirdly develops Luke and also weirdly develops Poseidon kind of being an asshole. And yeah. because in the next episode, you want to forget about all of that when um, they have the flashback scenes with Sally. So you like temporarily have to remember like, oh, Poseidon literally is like, this is like the worst people in the entire world giving advice about parenting. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, That's like when have you parented? Maybe like, Triton? <laughs> Maybe because he lives under sea with you? that's like our parents like yeah. running a support group to help other people parent their parents like you you should never tell anyone what to do and yeah. um but that's like Poseidon has no idea what he's doing like one of his kids he completely abandoned his entire life and he purposely says yes I abandoned him on purpose because it's too hard for me to watch him be sad and the other kid that we know of is a homeless child on the street in New York City <laughs> right like yeah. right now so it's like he's not doing that great and he for some reason is the one that Hermes is listening to when it comes to how you should parent your children and so it's like okay yeah. I'm not really sure that this is a good idea um I do like one thing with Hermes in this episode that I enjoy is when they get to like his car mm -hmm. um that the note to the dumb kids mm -hmm. I was like oh yeah <laughs> and the other little thing with Hermes I did enjoy in this season 
was his reaction to Medusa's head because he's the one that got to deliver that to them and yeah. hearing him be like you will not believe what is in this box <laughs> <laughs> like Hermes has the weirdest thing with Percy like uh, if you want to like I talk about how Percy is the scapegoat Luke is the fucking golden child of that world my god like <laughs> the the book version of like either way luke tries to kill percy the book version is honestly worse he like literally just gives him a scorpion and is like this will kill you in one minute goodbye yeah and doesn't tries to like recruit him for 30 seconds but basically goes out there just to kill him um and like the show version will last a little bit longer but the book version in the second book the reason why they go and like try to help clarice and stuff is because hermes helps them get out of camp so that they can go on the quest and he tells percy i want you to go on this quest because i want you to save luke i want you to like bring him back from chronos and it was like luke just tried to kill him <laughs> he literally tried to murder him it is a miracle in the books that he yeah. doesn't die he's like it's honestly a full-blown miracle that Percy is able to get close enough to camp for Annabeth to like notice that he's slowly being killed. And so it's like, he just tried to kill this child and you're telling him, go and help my son and convince him to come back. Because I think he is, in all of those books, he is telling Percy like, oh, Luke is just lost. He's mm -hmm. just lost. Even in the last book, he's like, Percy finally, like yells at him and and is like you know maybe if you were around when he was a child none of this would have ever happened because Hermes tries to blame Annabeth for Luke like going full on in like the last book or so and Percy yes. is like are you fucking kidding me like you're his dad if you were around none of this would have ever happened and he ends up having to apologize to Hermes for getting upset at him about it. But I'm like, this is the most golden child shit in the entire world. Yeah. He's got like, I know he's trying to kill you. I know he's trying to start another war with the Titans, but like, can I we know please? He just tried to kill you and your and also your best and like the only friends that you have. And mm -hmm. I know that he keeps trying to kill you consistently throughout all of these books. And he gives no indication that he doesn't want to be on Kronos' side. Like, Thalia literally pushes him off of a cliff <laughs> at yeah. some point. And Percy is hoping that he's dead and is, like, disappointed that he's not. And you're still trying to tell this kid, no, but you need to save my son because I think that you should and I think that he's worth saving. And it's like, what? <laughs> yeah. what? I don't even know. I do know because I'm the scapegoat of my family. And that reminds me of just how people will bend over backwards to like make excuses. Yeah. But it's just like, are you joking? <laughs> yeah, it is like, I mean, what redeeming qualities does Luke have besides his sword fighting abilities? But <laughs> Yeah, like, that, you think he's gonna get you chaos through his sword fighting if he would have it would have happened already <laughs> you're like hermes like i need i need you to understand that like the whole the whole thing with like luke's whole thing with hermes that i i liked when they like told you that backstory and i'm honestly curious if they're gonna tell us that backstory earlier than they did in the books i kind of hope that they do mm -hmm. um but i liked that backstory where Hermes wants to because his mom can like see through like the mist like Sally can mm -hmm. that they don't have they haven't had like an oracle for a long time and so they Hermes's idea is oh maybe you can like be the oracle and she like wants to do it because she wants to help she's kind of similar enough to Sally in that way which is like the weird parallel between Luke and Percy they make mm -hmm. where like Sally is they're both aware of who like that person is and that they're gods and about the whole world and they can and they can see through that stuff and see what's going on um and hermes doesn't know that the oracle has been like cursed by hades nobody has any idea that that's happened and like it's not like hades would like tell people that he did that he just did it and so they do this whole thing to make her the oracle and then it ends up horribly backfiring where she's like basically severely mentally ill and having like hallucinations for the rest of her life um if you want to be depressed she still is like that now like 
if you imagine like the the stories that are coming out now she's still always like that and has no idea what happened to luke because she's not like aware enough to know that but like that wasn't like they didn't mean for that to happen mm -hmm. like, hermes didn't do that on purpose he didn't mean for that to happen to her it just happened to her because they it was a horrible accident basically and yeah. yes like then hermes was not around and luke had to like run away when he was like nine because his mom was not like mentally there mm -hmm. um and hermes wasn't there but it's that's Uh, but that's the whole thing of um, that's the whole thing of um of that whole situation is i think that's why luke is like wanting so badly to be mad at someone mm -hmm. is because there isn't like a person to blame and he wants there to be someone to just blame and yeah. he could so he just tries to blame hermes for it even though it's not necessarily his fault completely it's just kind of an accident um, but I think that's why he's so angry and, and like is willing to join in everything because he just wants to be mad because there isn't somebody to blame. It's much harder when there isn't someone obvious to blame when it's like a million different people doing a bunch of bad things. It's like, but I just want to be mad at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so Hermes was the one who tried to make her into he, like, the Oracle? He, so he brought up the idea that they could do it like she but she like thought about it and she wanted to do it and so it's not like um it's not like he like forced her it's not like he did any of that like she was like oh i noticed that i can you know see through the mist and i noticed that i'm having like the prophetic sort of dreams that like demigods have and stuff like that and so i want to like help out my kid and the people in this world um, cause it would be like, you can imagine it, that it would be hard to be somebody like her or somebody like Sally, where mm -hmm. you know that these people are going through really hard things and they're it's being attacked by like monsters or just scary stuff. And you can't, and you can't do anything to help them because you're just like a normal person. You don't have any powers. You can't really do anything and so i can imagine somebody like that would want to do something active to feel like they can help their kid and anyone else who's going through that kind of stuff in that world and mm -hmm. so like it's very much the situation of well i think i could do this to help and hermes is like well you could try this to help but like she's the one that like brings it up to hermes in the first place and so it's not a situation of him getting her to do it Mm -hmm. which is why it's so freaking sad <laughs> yeah that, that like she's sitting at home like asking where luke is and making cookies for him and knowing that he and you know that he's never going to come back he's an evil monster and he's using what happened to her as the justification for being that way um yeah. but it's a very sad sort of thing like that where like when you look at other people's stories there's like a direct like person that you can more blame things on mm -hmm. like even with little stuff like percy you know losing his memory for six months of his life that's Hera's fault yeah. and um and annabeth will call her the cow bitch basically for the rest of her life because she hates Hera for doing that to him and there's and that's like a direct response or even like the stuff that happens with zeus or whatever there's like a direct response of zeus tells Percy to his face at least three times by the time he's 15 that he thinks that he should be killed by him. And so that's like directly, you can blame that. Like even like Annabeth, like her dad just doesn't really try very hard <laughs> to like get her back. Like, oh, yeah. that was one thing from the book that I, that was interesting was the part before they get to the casino, Annabeth is talking about when she went back to try to live with her dad Mm -hmm. that it wasn't successful because her stepmom is a bitch and was basically like oh my precious children might get hurt because you're different and weird and whatever and so she just ended up going back to camp and like because in the show version she doesn't go back until the end of the first season mm -hmm. so it makes me wonder um how successful that will be for her yeah i mean i think they need to make it still somewhat not very successful for her to want to come back to camp and like 
I mean, this is a part of her found family, too. I, she thinks her found family is Luke, but she finds out he doesn't really have her best interest in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, having her go back and try it and maybe it's not perfect or maybe something goes wrong, I think is still pretty integral to the story. Yeah, in the and it, it's interesting to think about in the way that like in the be very beginning of the of Sea of Monsters, like before before they even get to camp or anything like that, when Percy's like finishing out his seventh grade year, he has like a he has like a picture of Annabeth that he like printed off from some computer somewhere, like in his binder. And he like the narration in the book is like I part of the reason why I have this picture is to remind myself that this is real and that this actually happened because it must be yeah. so fucking weird to like have all of this happen during like your summer break and then you just go back to school and have to be a seventh grader with kids bullying you like kids use the arsler towards tyson and when he's at school like he's just going back to being bullied like he was like nothing ever happened it makes you feel like did that actually happen like do i actually yeah. have like friends like this and so he literally keeps her picture in like his binder at school every day and looks at it to remind himself like oh yeah annabeth is actually my friend and she exists somewhere in the world she's in san francisco i didn't like hallucinate that entire like situation happening that's actually real and so it, it like it makes me wonder like how that will be when they do start the second season like will annabeth already be there because she already gave up with her dad or will she just decide to stay there again after after they do their quest or whatever? Because she just doesn't want to deal with it anymore. Yeah. She's like, her dad is in, like, the third book, sort of. He he is, like, um, they he, like, helps them towards the end with, like, helping to save her somewhat. They, like, have to ask for his help. I forget why. They need something that he does. But um but like so there is a part it's like literally part of the story that he's always kind of this neglectful for lack of a better word like dad like he's never really like emotionally there for her even when things are better with her like where she doesn't feel like he hates her guts and that she doesn't have to like run away from home he still chooses his wife and, like his mortal family basically yeah and her whole like mirage thing in like the second book when she the siren moment when she like is swimming towards like her fantasy version her fantasy thing is imagining her being in an olympus that she like designed herself and athena and her dad being there as like a happy family and with luke and like none of those things are ever going to happen but even with her dad those things are never going to happen and it's like he never becomes like a good dad so we know that like something with him at some point will happen yeah well i mean you have to be pretty disconnected for your kid to run away at like six seven years old and for you not to chase after them um first of all yeah, yeah that's but, like the like, craziest part is that he yeah. doesn't he doesn't really try to go after her he like writes her a letter at camp being like i'm sorry that i didn't come after you but maybe we can are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. Is it completely candid that all of the partners can see through the mist, or is it only select ones? No, it's just certain ones. Um, like and I don't see women. <laughs> I don't remember if Annabeth's dad can or not. It's oh, Annabeth's dad is like. It's weird to think about like what he his his job and stuff <laughs> because he's like uh he works at like West Point. Like he's like a military guy that does like his he's getting like a PhD in like military history. Like the oh, that makes sense for Athena to like him though. <laughs> yes, that's why I think it's funny that Athena likes somebody like that because that's like why they need his help in the third. All I remember about his help in the third book is that he has like an old school like plane, like from mm -hmm. like World War II or something like that, and um. I can't remember if he makes, I think he makes like bullets that have like celestial bronze in them, the stuff that they use to like hurt beings in their world. Yeah. And so they need his help to have him fly the plane so he can shoot those 
bullets so they can try to save Annabeth since they're going after like Titans, like Atlas and things like that. Yeah. Um, as like a distraction basically so that they can get her away from them. And so they literally like, he has to be the one to do it because who else on planet earth is going to know how to fly a plane that has celestial bronze bullets, <laughs> but Annabeth's dad, who is a military like history geek. And it's like, of course, that's the person that Athena thinks is great. Is yeah. someone who's obsessed with like military, like propaganda and like, and strategy and stuff like that. But of I just think that's, it's funny for me to think about that because of how weird the military is in general like mm -hmm. they're like a little cult <laughs> yeah um, not a little cult, i mean if he cult. can't see through the mist like that makes his job a lot harder having this kid that's having all of this stuff happening mm -hmm. but it also makes it all the more puzzling that he doesn't like follow her and try to figure out what's going on mm -hmm. i mean that's definitely some neglectful parenting and i mean my my grandpa who there's some pretty crazy stories of back like when my my dad's family was kids military man so mm -hmm. um i do think that military men are just you know especially the ones that are career military or really into military history they're a different breed a little bit so yeah kind my, of my dad's my dad's dad was in the military he my dad was like born right after world war ii basically and like his some of his siblings were born during world war ii yeah so i can only imagine what somebody like that would actually i can't imagine what somebody would be like yeah. as that as a dad but so i can i can attest to that the village and my actually my mom's dad was also in world war ii yeah so explain so much about them <laughs> yeah we're a little bit further removed from the generation where men went into the military a little bit more regularly like now it's a different crowd that goes into the military but um yeah I, from my grandpa's story what i know i think he was running away from abuse but he did not break the cycle when he had his own kids he had seven so i mean Maybe that's part of it, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, Well, that's the whole thing about, like, when I was saying the military is like a cult. That's why I think it's funny that um, Annabeth's dad, who is, like, emotionally distant, like, mm -hmm. the whole th like, uh, I, I talk about, like, the different kinds of, like, abused kids in Percy Jackson, that they all are kind of, like, different ones. And the one that Annabeth is, is she's the one that has, like, emotional abuse, which is yeah. more kind of the abuse that you experienced where there isn't like a direct thing like like with Gabe it was obvious he was like threatening to hit Percy if he didn't give him his money and not tell his mom about it and yeah. things like that or like throw beer bottles at him and and things like that like that's like directly something that you can remember like the kind of stuff that I remember that's like there's no way that that's okay you know that that's bad but it's like it's a different kind of messed up to have a parent that is like physically there like her dad was like physically in the house with her but was like prioritizing his new wife and his new kids and mm -hmm. not her and so technically he's there as her dad technically he's not doing necessarily anything wrong or whatever but he's like he's not hitting her he's not like not feeding her or like not getting her to school but he's also ignoring her like he's yeah he's like the dad that probably has no idea who any of her even if she was around would have no idea who any of her friends were or like what her interests were or any of that because he just mm -hmm. doesn't put in the effort and that's that's like so much harder to to like almost notice what's missing that's kind of annabeth in this season is like her just because of being around someone like percy like having like noticing what is missing by like being around people like percy and grover who talk about how much they like her and appreciate her just naturally and that there isn't like effort involved in that for them they just do it without thinking about it and yeah. so it just makes you look at that other remember that other person and be like what's wrong with you <laughs> but like that's that's very much like annabeth's dad and when you when you compare annabeth's dad to luke that's one of the things that, like really interesting because luke was also pretty um not exactly emotionally there because he was too busy being angry all the time at yeah. everything he was like showing off kind of like he would he would like fight anything to and little annabeth thought that that meant that he was big and strong 
and like the best fighter and protector ever because mm -hmm. if you have nothing then you're yeah. gonna have somebody doing things like that is great that's how people end up with like that's how people like us end up in bad situations sometimes um and that's one of those it's actually part of like the story like thalia literally tells percy that in like the last book like luke was fighting everyone we ever ran into and that's why i died in the first place was because he wouldn't stop fighting people and yeah. it's funny because annabeth and percy don't do that yeah they, they get mad at clarice in the second book because she wants to fight anything just for kicks and so like they don't do that but like annabeth hasn't gone back to like those memories since she was young and like relook at them yet to be like actually wait <laughs> i feel like i would feel different about this if i was now at my like bigger age yeah i mean we've all been there we're like a found family member that we have that we think is the greatest person ever suddenly flips and we're like oh you're not who i thought you were oops <laughs> that's happened to me at least 50 different times in my life <laughs> Yeah, so it, it also checks out for that. But like, yeah, with her dad being emotionally neglectful and that being the only parent there, like I can't imagine that because my dad as like a, a weekend custody dad in a divorce was very much like, I'm gonna sit on the computer and work. I'm going to watch baseball, football, basketball, whatever sport happened to be in season. And um, yeah, let's just go get McDonald's, like nutritional neglect, um, you know, emotional neglect, um, sometimes physical neglect. We did not have like a place to sleep. Me and my brother slept on an air mattress on the floor mm -hmm. at his place, which I get like he couldn't afford the best apartments, but still, you know, the, there could have been something better. Yeah, and like, look at like Annabeth's parents. One of them is a dad that's emotionally distant. One of them is fucking Athena. Yeah. Whose like entire personality is not having any emotions and thinking so logically that she's like confused by people being upset with her because she's willing to sacrifice her daughter because she's being petty <laughs> like uh -huh. those were like the people she came from like no wonder why when she first met percy she didn't like him and was like combatant with him because she's so used to people being like that that somebody like percy that will just straight up say how he feels must be like are you an alien <laughs> that must be how she felt about him because it's like who are you right now i'm used to people never talking about anything and here's this kid being like my dad sucks mm -hmm. and i hate him and here's why let me write you an essay <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean going back to like how hermes is kind of playing with them and like tying that in with this is it very much is in line with the characterization we get of the gods and some of the like longer epic poems where it's like mm -hmm. we don't really care about the mortals even if they're ours you know like whatever the fates decide is going to happen i guess we'll just let it happen if we need to use them as little pawns on our battlefield whatever you know it's a very um yeah it's a really unhealthy view of what mortals are and you know, I actually found this out. I'm a little embarrassed. The quote that I keep saying from that I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure Achilles actually says it in the, the Iliad. It was literally only in the movie Troy, but it's still <laughs> true <laughs> that like the whole sentiment though is true that like life is more beautiful when you're mortal because there's an end, you know, like all of these experiences could end at any point. And if the gods were to look at their children that way of like, oh, shoot, I'm only going to have a small time with them, like Thetis does with Achilles, like, you know, it, they could have way more chaos. <laughs> um, uh, so part of the reason why they are so hard on their children is because chaos is almost inherited in a way mm -hmm. like you, your dad's deeds follow you and you're supposed to add to them and so like if your parent is a god and you do great things it looks good on them even if they had no hand in it yeah and, like yeah. imagine imagine too what it would be like if you were an immortal being and your abusive parent was also an immortal being and you could like never get away from them well, that's her or, that's hephaestus yeah and that's and like um uh, Zoe Nightshade is in the Titan's Curse, and her dad in that is um, Atlas. Mm -hmm. Atlas literally punches her to death in, 
in that book. Like she's poison, but he kills her. And it, it's her story is so interesting because um, she goes, she recognizes Riptide, mm -hmm. um, the sword, which was originally, uh, I think it was originally her, yeah, Hercules. It was originally Hercules' sword, and she recognizes it because she literally gave it to him, <laughs> like thousands of years ago. And so she's sitting there telling Percy, like, "Oh yeah, uh, that I know that sword," and it's like telling him his history. And it's funny because from that moment on percy fucking hates hercules <laughs> like in like some of the later books they the younger kids like mention hercules and he's like fuck that guy basically because of because of how hercules like betrays zoe mm -hmm. and she he's supposed to give like the sword back or something like that and he doesn't do it because he just wants it because he likes it and that gets her in huge trouble with atlas like her dad and so imagine for like thousands of years having to be on the run basically and hiding from your abusive dad. Like she becomes one of the heroes of, or the hunters of Artemis to try to get away from him and becomes like immortal to try to protect herself from him. Like that's, she's one of the, like the most interesting characters in Percy Jackson. I'm like really excited about seeing her because she's like, most of the hunters hate Percy purely because he's a boy. Mm -hmm. I swear to God, everyone is so fucking mean to him in that book for one reason or another. Those they're so hard on him for things that are absolutely not his fault. It's like scapegoat the book, that book. Everything is ridiculous with him. It's like, why are you being so hard on him for nothing? That none of this is his fault. Can you? Can we all just calm down and relax? But she is like one of the hunters that is actually really nice to him, and can tell that he's like a nice kid and is not like a, not a bad person the way that everyone else is treating him and you know it makes it even worse at the end when she gets killed by her dad um by the person that luke is like working with but it's it's like a whole thing of like i guess i love that these books take the myths and like the and make them real in a way that like actually make you feel like the emotions of what somebody would feel if this actually happened to you mm -hmm. and it like with the whole Hermes stuff in, or even just them, the end of this episode when they're at like the beach and Percy has to go in the water because he's supposed to talk to his dad and he like stops because he's like nervous and he's like scared about going in there because he's never talked to his dad before. And he asks them like, like what, like what should I even say to him? Yeah. And it's like, it's that I like that they stop all of the craziness of them like driving a cab into a wall and being in like a Lotus casino and forgetting who they are. And like five minutes before this happened, um, Grover doesn't even remember who Percy is. <laughs> He's just like, oh, we're going on a quest to find a car. That's fun. Um, yeah. And all that kind of stuff. But it like, it like grounds it back to reality of this is a 12 year old kid who's never spoken to his dad before. And he has no idea what to say to him now. And he has to go and talk to him. And it's not about like the powers and stuff anymore. It's purely just about him as a kid wanting, like having no idea how to talk to his parent. And that's like a universal feeling that every single person feels at least one time in your life. Yeah. Yeah. And like his dad, as far as abusive parents go, I would, Poseidon love bombs a little bit. Like it, it's like when you do something good, I'm going to praise you, give you attention, get, like help you out. But if you do something bad, I'm just, I'm not around. I'm not around for it. I'm not around to help you, nothing. Poseidon is interesting with Percy because Percy is definitely like his favorite child. Mm -hmm. um, but it makes sense because Percy makes him look really good. Yeah. Like Percy goes on five million quests, actual number four, um, in the first like couple years that he's in the world and he succeeds on all of them. Um, he literally saves everybody. And um, he, it gets a little bit more interesting <laughs> and like after he turns them down for immortality and stuff because they don't understand. Like one thing I think is kind of funny is um, as nice as Hephaestus is, to Percy and Annabeth and them. Um, part of the reason why Leo, his kid, in like the Heroes of Olympus books don't like Percy, like there's a lot of reasons why Leo is ridiculous with Percy, but one of the reasons 
is because he has a dream with his dad, Hephaestus, and Hephaestus thinks that Percy is basically an idiot for not taking immortality. Like, he literally tells Leo, like, Percy's kind of stupid. Like, he he says, like, it differently, yeah. but that's basically what he t- and that's the first thing that Leo ever hears about Percy, so of course he doesn't like him, and, like, puts him through all this horrible shit in those books that he doesn't deserve, because his dad immediately tells him that. And the reason why his dad says that is because he thinks that it's stupid to turn down the chance of immortality because they don't even understand what the what like what their kids even want but it's that whole thing that like poseidon loves is like nicest to percy but like what does that actually mean (laughs) because he like does it it reminds me see this is you know what this means this reminds me of times when my dad would do stuff like this with me where he would be nicer to me than nicer to me than like he would pay more attention to me he would talk about similar things that we had in common like sports and stuff with me that he wouldn't do with like my mom or my sister and my sister always hated that obviously and because they didn't have those things in common and because he was giving like this attention to me, he was gonna do it regardless of if I wanted it or not. It was actually not a good thing at all, um, but that's what he did. And so it gives you like the idea that they like you, mm-hmm. but it's like, they only like you to a certain point because like in the later book, when Percy falls into literal hell, Poseidon doesn't help him. He literally says that he can't help him get out of there. And it's like, what fucking use are you if your favorite son falls into Tartarus and is being tortured? Like, the stuff in there is off the charts bad that happened to them. It's just like relentless when they're down there. They never get it. Like, imagine, imagine you've killed 5,000 monsters and then you go to the place that they get sent. (laughs) Yeah. And you're just like stuck down there and you're like, and you have to somehow get out of like there's monsters that they killed that find them down there and try to kill them again and so imagine you're down there and you're extremely powerful dad who's one of the most powerful gods there is who could go down there to help you says like oh i'm not allowed to so i'm just not going to mm-hmm. and it's like okay so all the stuff that you say about me about how much you love me and love my mom and things like that does that actually even matter because you're not actually going to help me when it even when it would actually be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there's any other Lotus Hotel thoughts on this one. Mm. Or Lotus Cas- Casino Hotel, I guess. <laughs> like, it's kind of both. It's, I don't know. I like how, <laughs> one thing purely just with like Percy and Annabeth's friendship that I like is that Annabeth, um, the, the like back and forth, um, it's the little things where they show like the progression of their friendship getting better over time. Like in the fourth episode, she he asks like, can I ask you a stupid question? And she's like, and she like, is like, do you need me to make fun of you? In this episode, he's like, can I ask you a stupid question? And she's like, she just looks at him like, dude, like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make fun of you anymore. And mm-hmm. he tells her about like his dream. But the other part is that she pickpockets Hermes. I that's one of my favorite like kind of acting back and forth where they just have like good chemistry where she's like you pickpocketed a god and she's like I'm multi-talented yeah. <laughs> like what was that like like I, I was like what was that supposed to be hard <laughs> yeah well that's that's honestly like so badass because she like she pickpocketed the god of thieves like <laughs> and like I one part that I think is kind of fun is fun for people to think about too is that when even though on screen it only lasts for like two minutes or something where she gets up and she's like i'm done with you when she realizes that hermes isn't going to help them Mm -hmm. um and you know we know now she goes to like pickpocket him but there's like two or three minutes where percy is talking to him alone and then he goes back out into the casino and he goes to find annabeth like time wise that's only like two or three minutes but in this casino that was like an entire day probably had gone by and he somehow did not forget about her. And it's like, it's one of those wild things where 
like it makes sense later on that Percy doesn't forget like doesn't forget her when he loses all of his other memories because for some reason he just like doesn't forget her because it's that funny scene where he sees the other older satyr and he looks at him and he's like wow Grover's really old <laughs> like, so he's alone by himself for three minutes and he like forgets who Grover is like Annabeth has to remind him that Grover is with him on the quest but he doesn't forget about her and it's just one of those funny like little things that they can put in because they know what happens in the future but yeah. it's cool like oh yeah I didn't think about that when I first saw the when I first saw it because it is it does go by pretty quickly but in this casino that like being alone for like two or three minutes you could like forget your entire identity yeah yeah so I, I also love that that Easter egg. And I mean, that's more of like a modern fairy tale thing. I've been rewatching Once Upon a Time lately. So that's kind of just what's dancing in my head. Um, but like um, the idea that true love is this magic, you know, and so it's kind of planting those seeds a little bit that like their bond is that great that they won't forget about each other. Their biggest fears are losing each other. And like, even though they started off kind of more adversarially they just like they come to be more complementary you know like their personalities complement each other and they still push each other towards what their goals are mm -hmm. and um yeah it's it's cool to watch like the seeds of that start when they're very young yeah, and the, the thing i always love about percy and annabeth is that they were best friends for many many yeah. years and so like their friendship is purely like a friendship that just naturally became more when they were just older and had more of an idea of who they were and so it's a very natural progression but their friendship is also like beautiful without having to add in like the romantic stuff to it eventually but like it's still great even before they ever get to that point um it's cute how they're like smiling at each other because he's figuring out how to drive which well yeah a 12 year old learning how to drive would one of the the thing in this episode and the next episode that is funny is when percy's like new york city-ness comes out because he's mm -hmm. you know he grew up in new york city that in this episode, he's already beeping at somebody and yelling at them and having road rage. And he doesn't know how to drive, but he's like, what are you doing? You didn't even stop. <laughs> he's 12. And in the next episode, when they go to like the underworld and he's pushing through, he's like, only suckers wait in line. <laughs> and I'm like, you're such a New Yorker. Yeah, well, honestly, like all of the shades lined up, it's not gonna help him to stand in that line anyways, so. And just, the way that he in the next episode when he talks to like of uh, Karen, I think is how you say his name. Yeah, he's like he's and he you're and he's like you're not dead and he's like we're all dying sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the thing heroes have had to face. Um, I I made a video on the underworld. I'm sure you saw that part. Um, but like oh di or no, it was Aeneas in Virgil's Aeneid, so this is a Roman source, mm -hmm. um, Aeneas gets stopped at the ferryman also because he's like, okay, when I when Hercules went through, he took Cerberus. The last time I let other dudes in, they tried to kidnap Persephone. I'm not mm -hmm. letting a mortal guy pass through. And Aeneas has to convince him, like, no, I'm here for good reasons. I'm just going to pass through. I just need to talk to somebody. <laughs> like, and um, so, yeah, it's interesting that that's the strategy that Percy tries. It's very <laughs> Percy to be like, I, I am dying. Um, again, are. tactically. He's very consistent with that because in like the fourth episode or fifth episode when Annabeth is like, oh, I saw the fates and one of us is going to die. He's like, well, yeah, we're all going to die eventually. <laughs> like, like this is like existential like moment I'm having and they're like no like right now <laughs> yeah and he's like no it's kind of weird how he's just immediately accepted that that could be a consequence of this world he's just immediately like yeah it might happen that's that's a whole abused kid thing like it, when you have somebody who's like in some way physically abusive towards you you're used to just believing that you're gonna die like it's honestly fucking 
weird to still to this day it is weird for me that i'm not going to die anytime soon like it it feels like an um it feels like a like an abstract concept like the idea of me becoming old um like when i was younger i used to like try to imagine what i would look like when i was like 60 years old and i could never imagine it because i couldn't imagine me ever living that long and so when you have like someone in your house that is being physically abusive towards you and you don't know he doesn't know it yet but physically abusive towards his mom too but just with him mm -hmm. like you're just used to like being afraid of dying and you just kind of make peace with it you're like whatever like i i worry about this all the time anyway before i ever even entered this world so big fucking deal that like i might get killed by actual monsters i've been afraid of being killed by my stepdad all these years anyway so yeah. that's that's not anything that's not anything new for him so that's i think it's funny because the way that he like is very sarcastic about death is how i talk about death where like especially when i was younger i was people would say like oh you might die and i'd be like whatever i don't care yeah. like i would I, it's just not something that I would ever take that seriously because it doesn't feel that scary <laughs> when yeah. it, when like you're it's just I don't know how to describe that other than when you're used to being worried about it it just doesn't feel as scary to die especially if you're not that happy with how your life is going and yeah. so for him it makes sense that he would be the one that's like making fun of them almost for being worried about that <laughs> and also just being like I refuse to believe that fate can like tell me when I'm I when I want to make that choice like I also hate that too like me I like spirituality things but I also have a huge like chip on my shoulder with a lot of spirituality things that try to tell me that my life is like predestined or predetermined or whatever and I'm like fuck you yeah <laughs> like, I, I'm gonna live my life the way that I want to no one can tell me what I'm gonna do <laughs> palmistry stuff supposedly like I think this line that I have that goes like fully across my palm is supposed to be your wealth line. Yeah, right. <laughs> Where is it? Where is it? <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I I do get that from the like abused kid perspective. It's also just like it's kind of how heroes operate in the world mm -hmm. is like, well, if I'm going to go out, at least let me go out swinging, which is what we see with him jumping in the chair instead of Annabeth. Him, mm -hmm. you know, like switching places with her with a chimera. He's just not only is he resigned to it, but he's like, you know what? If they're going to take me out, they're going to I am going to make sure my friends get as far as they need to from this whole ordeal. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, like. It, it happens so organically that you don't realize that like he's just enacting the part of a hero without like without thinking about it it's just who he is mm -hmm. oh and one thing with grover i wanted to say in this episode is that i love i love the scenes where he like doesn't remember who he is because he's just very funny but it's also like almost like innocent grover like he like wants to help out because he thinks it's fun, even though he has absolutely no idea who these people are or like what they're actually trying to do. He's like, yeah, I'll help you find a car. No, that's not that's not the quest we're on. We also have to go to California. And he's just like, sure. And it's just kind of like an ad like adorable side of him where mm -hmm. he has to like like he can't drive when he normally would have because he has no idea who he is. And so like yeah. Can you have somebody who basically has extreme amnesia drive a car? Probably not. So the 12 year old has to do it instead. Um, but it's just like really sweet when they get to like California and they're on the beach and he all of a sudden like remembers like, oh, like you guys are my best friends. How could I possibly forget about you? And it's just um, like there's that one line where like Annabeth says um, when they when he says like, God, why did I forget about like so much more? than you guys and they say like you know it's easier to forget who you are when you're alone and I was like god <laughs> like way to like be like existential and like philosophical but that's also like one of those lines that is true for like the entire kind of series like they don't know obviously about Luke yet they're like kind of about to find out about him in the next episode mm -hmm. but it is true that it's a lot easier for them to get through everything they're doing if they stay together. It's when they separate that things start getting weird. Like, um, I, I keep talking about Heroes of Olympus books, but um, Grover isn't in 
really those books yeah. like percy and him have like a their whole like empathy link thing they still have it in those books and so somewhere uh grover is having like multiple panic attacks feeling percy almost die multiple times when they're in tartarus alone and how scared he would have been down there but he's not actually there with them in like they talk to him a couple times but he's not actually there and um i feel like he has to not be there because if if Grover wasn't there, if Grover was there also with Annabeth, the way that the other kids were treating Percy would never fly. He would like pick them up and throw them off the boat. <laughs> and like Leo would like have the fear of God put in him between like Grover and Annabeth, they would never allow that to happen. And so if you if you're gonna have your new characters not understand Percy and just be kind of low key like almost bully him through that series because they have no idea who the fuck this child is and they don't even try to find out you have to separate him from his best friends in some way and so grover can't really be there because he would he would get really upset by how they were treating him and be like what are you talking about he would start trying to sing the consensus song <laughs> but i just i love those scenes with Aryan because he plays Grover almost like he's a little kid when he doesn't remember anything and it's very it's just very sweet to see them do that yeah they definitely play up that part of Arian's personality with Grover like that's the part of Grover they distilled into him into his rewrite of Grover Arian is so funny like if you ever want to laugh some of his TikToks have been muted because of stupid yeah. universal music yeah. shit because they're so stupid but um he does the he hardly posts anything but the stuff that he posts is so funny <laughs> yeah, just... the one you sent me with the dresses i like that one as a preview for what's to come with polyphemus oh, yeah. uh, because oh, yeah. he's gonna have to do so much comedy in the next one. Oh yeah and he's gonna be like that's gonna be like the best thing that's ever happened and yeah, yeah. um another TikTok he did that i think is that is muted is <laughs> him and like a friend of his that's like some person for like their age because she has like millions of followers i, she, I think she's an actress of some kind i just don't know who she is because i'm too old um she does a lot of the TikToks with him um she's the one that's in the TikTok with him in the dress she's like the girl oh yeah she's like oh now one of us is gonna have to change that whole thing but they do a TikTok where she makes him watch salt burn <laughs> <laughs> and it's literally him basically dying 57 times because he obviously doesn't want to watch the movie. And I don't even know that much about that movie on purpose because I don't want to know because of no, how people talk about it. it. Um, but like in the comments of that TikTok, she like left one being like, oh, you like really enjoyed watching this movie. And he writes in capsule like wrong buzzer like going off. No, <laughs> like his his comments on TikTok are so funny. Like he wants he posted like a Percy Jackson one after not posting anything for like a year. And somebody was like, why have you been gone for this long? And he's like, daddy's returned. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. That kid. I would, I want to see what he does after this because he is That's going. So I'm like, could him and like Walker get a podcast where they just talk to each other because they're so funny the way that they play off of one another yeah and all that and just Aryan alone can somebody just like record him when he's talking <laughs> because he's just so funny yeah, and he's not more even behind quiet. the scenes of them like he's just like being himself it's just his natural humor but it's just hilarious to watch him just just go off <laughs> yeah I gotta get going soon but like final thing I want to talk about is that tweet that I sent you so um I saw on like um it was on the subreddit for LGBTQ plus where um, yeah. someone had tweeted, they replied to JK Rowling had tweeted something that was supposed to be evidence against like being transgender. And so someone who replied to that is like, oh, so when Emma and Dan like come back to you because of all of this, like this facts, then you're going to open them with welcome hands. And she's like, no, I'm not. Um, but yeah, we have Rick writing non-binary characters because he's sad he didn't do more for them as a teacher. Like, yeah, like um, I was I said this to you, but I'll just say it again that um, the Magnus Chase series is his series he did with um, Nordic Nordic 
gods. And so Loki is somebody in that series. He's a character in the series anyway, and Thor is as well. The series is actually them trying to help Thor get his hammer back. And, um, but the like person that's his like best friend, that's also like his kind of like love interest person is lo a Loki kid. And so she's gender fluid because if you were gen, if you were a Loki child, you were going to be gender fluid to the max. And so yeah. those, I only read the first book because after I read the first one was when I just like stopped reading for many years. It wasn't because I didn't enjoy it, but like the character's name I think is Alex. Mm -hmm. And she is, or they are like, like, I remember those books, that book, the first book in that series came out in 2015. And so for younger people, 2015 was the year that gay marriage was made legal in the United States. Like that, it doesn't feel like that was that long ago, but like LGBT like rights and especially with like transness, like the idea of like different genders has progressed a lot since those years that was like reading those that book was literally the first time that i've ever that i ever saw a gender fluid character ever and like it, i didn't even like before like i consider myself gender fluid and i didn't actually understand what gender fluid even really meant by that point and like reading that book i was like oh like in the book version she like literally or they can literally like change like what whether they're like male or female presenting on the day because she's a Loki like kid and it's magical and that can happen. But like it's just part of her character and she's a love interest like Magnus is Annabeth's cousin. <laughs> His name is Magnus Chase and he's and like like that's who he ends up with is yeah. a gender fluid person. And so it's like here's Rick Riordan writing a series where like the where like the fem like female I guess character or like love interest is gender fluid and it's just like a part of her character like people don't talk about it as if it's weird or different or strange it's just accepted as because she's a Loki child obviously that's how she's gonna be and you have like Rick Riordan writing blogs and stuff talking about how he wants people to feel accepted like um, Nico is gay and you don't you probably don't know you might not know that yet but they there's a whole storyline in hero of olympus that came out around the same time like the last year of olympus book came out in 2015 as well and in that book is when um nico gets outed by cupid because cupid is a fucking asshole and and is like forced he is forced to tell them that he's gay and that he had a crush on percy and that because everyone thought that he had a crush on Annabeth because he didn't like Annabeth, but then Cupid forces him in order for them to get something they need for like their quest to admit that he didn't like Annabeth because he was jealous that she got to be with Percy and that he actually had like an idealized like crush or whatever on Percy. And he had a lot of internalized homophobia because he grew up in the 1930s um, and is like, and is afraid, like he literally is afraid that the kids will like not want to be around him anymore and like the other characters are like no if anyone does that to you we'll fucking kick their ass basically is what they say but like yeah. he has an entire book later on with him and his boyfriend and his boyfriend will is in the books and is like bisexual <laughs> and it's just like they like with rick riordan books you could basically canonize anyone as being part of the queer community and rick riordan will be like yeah that's fine I don't care yeah. like literally think whatever you want to think he's basically said that before and i wouldn't and like as more time goes on he will probably make more people the different identities and things like that in that world because yeah that makes sense and it's just it's wild to see like jk rowling be like daniel radcliffe should apologize to me because i because i cast him in this movie when he was 11. <laughs> Yeah, or and that, that, or like even Emma just Emma Watson should be, and it's like they never. The, the wild thing about that whole comment is that Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson are both they're both very intelligent kids. Like when the when the Harry Potter movies were being made, it was funny like reading interviews with like some of the older kids that would be on set with them because they would talk about how the two of them would get in like these very intense like philosophical like existential like discussions about like 
serious topics that you wouldn't think like two 14 year olds would be arguing about. Like they would sometimes argue about like serious things and not talk to each other for hours because of this discussion they were having. And so like, I don't know what would make you think that two kids like that would be okay with you being transphobic, but it's also the thing that neither one of them has like expressly come out and like objectively just said JK Rowling is a bitch and, or like anything they've like said that they support the trans community over and over and over again and like obviously they feel like they need to say that to her, like yeah. counteract her and so that people like there are people on the cast like tom felton that are also transphobic and try to like defend he's weirdly being a villain like okay like just go with your character okay you were casted right i guess <laughs> yeah but like so they they like dan like dan and Radcliffe, i saw made like a statement where he just talked about how he's worked with the Trevor Project for years. And he just like lists all the statistics about people, like the high rates of like suicidality around trans people when they aren't allowed to like say what their identity is and have to pretend like they're not and and all this kind of stuff. And so like neither one of them have even like come out and said anything mean to her. And so it's like, where are you? Why are you saying these yeah, comments? You knew these people when they were like nine. Like, yeah, like what are you doing, lady? And like, yeah, they became famous because they were a part of your franchise, but that's seen as almost like a bad thing at this point because everyone hates you. Yeah. So, like Warner Brothers is literally trying to like redo a movie series that just ended fifth, like 10 years ago because nobody wants to watch things involving you and they're hoping that if they redo it with completely new actors that little kids won't realize that a transphobic monster is getting all the money from it because all the adults know that by this point and don't want to be involved anymore and it's just like wild to me that she feels like they owe her anything at all like you're a billionaire like yeah. you're a billion she makes so much money off of all of the harry potter like merch everything and yeah like she like made deals to make sure she made as much money as possible with everything, even like the parks and stuff. And so it's like you make a disgusting amount of money and you use the money you make to try to kill trans people. And you think that these people that you cast in a movie when they were little kids owe you anything at all because they don't want to be associated with that. Like the thing that with JK Rowling that I always get really mad about because she tries to she tries to justify what she does because she was um, sexually assaulted by the guy that she made Ron off of, the abusive relationship she was in. What does um, that have to do with trans people though? <laughs> Cause well, it's like a whole thing of like, they're, se they're afraid of men. Like that's the whole weird thing with like TERFs is that they're actually afraid of men. So they think that women, like trans women are never actually women, they're men. And so they feel like, men are like dangerous and predatory and are going into like bathrooms or places where women are supposed to be to like pr be predatory towards women in a, like a new way and they're basically putting like the trauma they've been on they've been through with like cis men cis straight men onto everyone else but cis straight men and so like the part of that tweet that drove me up the wall that i knew i needed to rant about was like her saying something about women who need women only spaces and i was just like is this like a weird assumption of like like i'm a rape victim many times over i would feel safer with trans people than turfs so like what women only space are you talking about where trans women women being there would somehow be bad like if me who grew up being like that for many 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 years yeah but someone i lived with on a daily basis most of the time don't feel the need for that in that way by like literally show me your genitals before i will hang out with you then why are you like that like you're a billionaire you don't have to be around people you can literally pay people to leave you alone <laughs> so like what are you talking about what like she could go full on Jennifer Lopez and go out and like, don't look at me, don't yeah. talk to me. She um, does like where she lives in like Scotland, like she never leaves her house or goes anywhere or does anything. She complains about like how much taxes she has to pay and things like that, but because she's horrible, but like, I don't, I hate the idea that TERFs use that like to try to justify 
the hate trade that they do to be like, oh, well, some women are sexually abused. And it's like, that's nice. Some women out there could be sexually abused by other women. Yeah. Have you met lesbians? That happens to them sometimes. And like, so it's like that and like, outside of lesbianism, it happens too. But I'm just using that as an example, because I know she's tried to like, be friends with horrible turfy lesbians in the past too. But it's just like, they don't think about anything else but that they just think like, oh, well, all men have to be predatory. So if you're a man pretending to be a woman, you have to be doing it only to get close to women to hurt them. And it's like, I don't under I will never understand how people like her end up like that. Because it's like, you would think that somebody like me with my history would end up like that. And I could not be less like that. So it's like, why are you like this? Yeah. And like, I mean, so she wrote men pretending to be women into her books. She, after the fact, queered Dumbledore. And like, that's not in the books at all. What I, from my knowledge, because I never watched any of the like prequel movies, I'm pretty sure they didn't even put it in that, even though there's yeah, a Grindelwald movie. I didn't like, watch any of those movies either, but that was like the big thing that people were losing their fucking minds over is that she did an entire movie about like Dumbledore when he was younger and the guy that was his boyfriend. But in that movie, like magically, somehow they're not gay on screen and it never magically comes up. And why is, then why did you make him gay? <laughs> Yeah, so it was all just lip service from the beginning, and unlike, mm -hmm. unlike Rick, who was like, actually, I I love queer people. I have had queer students, and I feel bad that I did not do enough for them. Like he is an angel compared to her when it comes to this whole issue. Yeah, he is a he's such a sweetheart when it comes to that, and that, and the thing I know I said this in like one of our first episodes. I said that Rick is somebody that is not perfect he makes mistakes but he also is open to hearing what those yeah. mistakes are and is open to like changing and he does that like he he like realizes like okay yeah a lot of my books had a lot of straight people in them so now let's like make whoever you want queer and let's make like nico is like let's make nico and will like gay or bisexual let's have like gender fluid characters let's do whatever you want and the sexuality of like the all the other characters are pretty much up in the air and mm -hmm. he like will listen to what fans say about why we think that person might be this identity or whatever and if it makes sense to him he'll can he actually thinks about it and will like might put it in his story as opposed to jk rowling who just like mocks you <laughs> basically yeah if you even have a different idea about her story than what she wants and everybody is so fucking straight and like wolf star is the biggest example of that right where everybody loves the idea of remus and lupin being in love but no no we can't have that we're gonna have lupin fall in love with a girl that's much younger than her and they're both gonna die and sirius is gonna die alone <laughs> yeah to the point that like jk rowling hated the marauders like fan fiction so much back in the day like she was like threatening to like sue people over it oh in like the early 2000s when there were people still threatening stuff like that she hated that so much and it's like then like you wrote you wrote a story where a bunch of teenage boys who all are going through hard times all become like can like may become animals and they become animals because their best friend is a werewolf and so they become animals so, to make him feel better about doing that and you didn't think that any teenage girl out there would read that and be like I want them to kiss like they literally changed their DNA and Sirius is the one who gets the closest to a wolf yes. yeah I like okay I, I do have to go because I have a guest over and it sounds like my nephew woke up from his nap so okay. all right but yeah like we should rant about this more because I'm sure there's more examples of Rick doing this fabulously or taking feedback from fans and actually incorporating it whereas yeah jk rowling's like i'm gonna sue you yep yep <laughs> all right i'll talk to you later bye bye